this year and a look forward to 2019 and beyond. I'm Judge Janine Pirro. Thanks so much for being with us. And it is our first ever justice with a studio audience. And I couldn't be more excited. I think they are too. I know because I spoke with them. And they're going to be taking part and asking questions throughout the show. Plus, if you'd like to take part at home, tweet your comments at Judge Janine. Now, we have a fantastic lineup of all-star guests tonight. We'll surprise you every block, and you can't miss a moment of it. So let's bring out my first guest. He's fought tirelessly in Congress for the American people over the last 18 years. A big welcome for my friend and, of course, yours, Congressman Daryl Issa. Good evening, Congressman. Good evening, Judge. How are you? I'm doing great. Good. Good to see you. All right. So... Uh, here we are, almost the end of the year. You're finishing up 18 years in Congress. I have been dying to ask you this question. What can you tell us that you couldn't tell us before? What frustrated you the most? What did you have to do in order to stay in Congress that frustrated you? Well, those are several great questions. <laughs> the one that I think listeners would not be surprised or viewers would not be surprised, but that really does burn me is the difference between what people say on the campaign trail and what they do in my party. In other words, we want to end the death tax. No, they don't. They just don't want to pay it themselves. We want to lower taxes. No, we really just want to lower taxes on ourselves. There's wow. a tremendous amount of self-serving there. And you see it in the negotiations for principled solutions versus what actually gets negotiated. It's one of the reasons that so many of these tax deals are temporary. Uh, it's one of the things that's exciting about part of the president's tax reform, which is it's permanent. Well, you know, when you talk like that, I say to myself, you know, we are, you know, we expect loyalty to party, right? And I understand that. I understand you have to be with your party to make sure you get your agenda done. But sometimes as I look at Paul Ryan, as I look at what happened with some of the committees and Paul Ryan not being willing, you know, to, to kind of hit the button on a lot of stuff going on with respect to Comey. And, you know, we saw at the end of December, you know, James Comey comes and testifies uh, at, at a house uh, before House committees. Right. It's way too late. Nothing can be done. I wonder if they really believe in what they're saying or if it's just theater to them. Well, you know, in, in Congress, there's always somebody who really believes it, and then there's the rest of the Congress. And, and certainly, th this latest thing with bringing in Comey really is an example of too little, too late. On the other hand, there are things that are still being worked on as we get to the end of the Congress. And one of them, for example, uh, it's pretty technical, but it's some of the immigration reform stuff that has broad support that actually still could get done, that the president has talked about and asked for uh, these high-tech immigrant, the H-1Bs right, right. and, and so we'll on. Right, talk about that. Right. Yeah. Those are areas where we could still get it done, but there's always sort of the people who, who wanted to wait. We'll do it later. We'll do it later. But how does it benefit them to not produce for the American people? You know, having gone through an election where my proposed successor didn't get across the finish line because it wasn't a good year in California for Republicans, uh, I've got to tell you, if we had done more we'd have been better treated by the voters. There's no question at all that not living up to the president's agenda, not living up to his aspirations, has cost the House of Representatives its majority. Well, no question about that. And we're going to talk about that. But uh, right now, I'm going to bring out some new guests. Uh, Congressman Issa, stay there. Our next two guests are real players responsible for helping to get Donald Trump elected. They are the authors of the new book, Trump's Enemies. Trump's former campaign manager, former director, deputy campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski and David Bossy are both here. Hi, guys. Hi, Judge. How are you? Great to see you. Great to see you. Hello. How are you? Long time not seeing you, sir. All right. So, listen, guys, you got a great new book out, and I'm not going to talk about it right now. Thanks, Judge. What I want to talk about. <laughs> What what is it? Where is it on the <laughs> bestseller list? It's, it's, it's on right the New York Times bestseller list, so we're very happy. Congratulations. It may be fake news, I, but it's our fake news. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And you know what? Now I feel like I'm part of your club. <laughs> but listen, uh, you know, what, what the congressman and I didn't have time to talk about, I want to talk to you guys about, is the economy. We saw the GDP in 2018 hit 
record highs, uh, but then it started to falter a little bit at the end of the year. You know, unemployment has stayed pretty good at 3.7 percent, but there was some volatility in the stock market that we saw, you know, in mid-December. What's going on and what can the president do to make sure that he can continue to deliver on the message that apparently the House couldn't deliver on? Corey. Well, I think part of it is, as you know, this president has focused the American trade policy on renegotiating bad trade deals. When you look at what he's done between Canada and Mexico and the United States, getting rid of NAFTA and renegotiating that, that's a positive. But you also have to think about what he did with President Xi of China. He said, we're going to put a temporary stay on putting more tariffs on you. Right. And that was supposed to bring the market to these amazing numbers. And for a period... The market was up over a three-day period, the highest it's been in six years. So the market responded, but it's very fickle. And now what we're seeing, Judge, over the last two or three or four weeks is every time the market goes down, whether it's 10 points or 50 points, they're now blaming the president. Unlike for all those times where it set record highs under his, his yeah, administration. Yeah, it was they never, never the him president ever. who no, did it. It, it was him. Barack Obama. It was Barack Obama who built this, right? You but know, all maybe sudden, I'm wrong. Am I wrong? Did fault. Barack Obama build it? No, Barack Obama destroyed our economy. This president's taken the last two years to build it up, whether it's bringing manufacturing jobs back, whether it is uh, uh, our, the energy sector, whether it is re renegotiating these bad trade deals. I think there's a lot of uncertainty uh, out there in the markets. And, and I'm not an economist, but I'm a political guy. And I look at the investigations that are about to oh, beset yes. this president and right. this White House. You are going to see a White House that is going to be under siege by the Democrat controlled House here very shortly. And you're going to see uh, a, a White House that is naturally going to constrict in its ability to get a legislative agenda through as well as other priorities on, well, the, on the economy. Let me, that's let me a ask big you deal. this, Congressman. I mean, you know, the House couldn't do what it could have, it might have done. It, we it lost didn't, seats. It didn't do Why? It. Well, because the House the House is known for passing things and then letting the Senate fail to, to do it. This time, there were a lot of things we didn't pass. We didn't even send them to the Senate yeah, that the president the wanted. Yeah, but so good. Why didn't Republicans win and keep the House? You know, and it, the economy is an interesting uh, and fickle thing. In a good economy, a lot of Republicans don't get real excited and turn out. Democrats looking at Donald Trump and despising him did turn out. But, you know, one of the things about the economy, some people score the economy based on, you know, 3.7 percent unemployment and so on. How about we score it like it was the real battle that it is between us and the Chinese? Last quarter, Chinese, 1.3 percent growth. Less than two months ago, I was at the World Economic Forum in China. Company after company told me about their leaving China. They're building their new factory in Vietnam or South Korea. Oh, boy. The fact Not is, here. I was hoping fact, you were, I was hoping well, you were right. saying the U.S. The Not. Fact, well, no, a lot are being built in the U.S., and we see those every day. But we don't see what's moving out of China just to move out of China. What China is dealing with is we're in this so-called war. And we're winning it. Yes, we're growing at X rate, but China has decelerated from its typical over 10 percent to 1.3 percent. They are in a free fall. All right. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is I know we have a question from our audience. Uh, and uh, I believe, sir, uh, Ernie, I'll just call you Ernie. You're Ernie, right? Ernie. All right, Ernie. Um, Ernie's question is, what does the situation with China mean for the economy, and could things get worse? Well, I think I just gave you a part of that. Uh, China is in a free fall. China ha still has more than half a billion people they're trying to get modern 21st century jobs for, and they don't have a way to get it, and the rest of the world is starting to eat their lunch, and they have an inflation problem, and quite frankly, they've gone back to being a communist dictatorship. So that's where China is. What does it mean for us? It means that we're gonna have a more diverse group of vendors for the United States. Our partnership with Canada, our partnership with Mexico, renegotiated under this president is going to grow. All right, and I think you had an additional question. Yes, and the additional question, and what will that do? What will that, what that, what will that effect be on our elections coming up in 2020? 
<clears throat> well, look, as, as it relates to China, you have to think we're, we're they're now agreeing to open their markets to our agriculture products because of the sit down conversation that President Trump had with President Xi. They have blocked us from putting our exports there for a long time because they didn't want to compete against the United States. But that renegotiation is everything is witnessed at the ballot box. When people are doing well, they have to ask themselves a very simple question, which was asked under the Clinton administration and the Obama administration for a reelection effort. Am I better off today than I was two or four years ago? When you look at economic security, you look at homeland security, and you look at national security, every economic indicator of those issues says, yes, we are stronger today under the Trump administration than we were two years ago, right. which bodes very well for a re-election campaign. And, and, and Joe, right. if I could, just ahead, one Dan. more thing. One more thing is, in that conversation with President Xi, President Trump asked uh, the Chinese president to take a stand on the opioid issue. Ah, and, yes. And that is a, yep. that potentially two years from now, not today, but two years from now, is going to be able to rein in this, help us rein this right. tragedy in that is going on in this country. And I think that the American people hopefully will see the fruits of that labor as All well. All right. And now I believe we have another question from the audience. Yes. Recently, I've seen a lot of headlines that the economy is just dropping, the stock market's crashing. It's been very worrying to me. And I'm wondering, could we be headed for another recession? Look, I, look, I'm not an economist, and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so I'm just going to give you my ideas. Um, but the, the truth is, um, I don't think so, because every economic indicator is showing that we're still expanding. Our economy is growing. It's not receding. We have to be very cautious of the Federal Reserve continuing to raise interest rates. It's something the president's been very candid about. He's been very vocal about it. We have to understand people are finally having more money in their pockets for the first time in literally a decade. Under the Bush and then the Obama economy, people didn't have job opportunities. And not just the new jobs, but what you're seeing in our economy right now is people who have jobs have opportunities to move to other places that didn't exist because the deregulation that this president has impacted in our environment, which means more economic opportunities for everybody. Go ahead, and I'd, like to, I'd love to find a way to get the millennials to, yeah. to, to get into the housing market, right? That, that's one of the soft spots that we see in the economy coming up in, in the next several quarters uh, is that we see the, with the interest rates going up, the millennials have to understand uh, and want to participate in that right. American dream right. that we're gonna we talk have about for 200 that, years uh, have, has always been a bedrock of our economy. Yeah, we're going to talk about millennials in, in just a few minutes. But Corey Lewandowski, David Bossie will both be back in a few minutes. And Congressman Issa is staying to tackle our next topic. Welcome back to our Justice Special, Immigration, the crisis at the southern border, a key issue for the Trump administration this year. It will certainly continue to be in 2019. Congressman Darrell Issa is still with us to weigh in. But first, let's bring in our surprise guest. Hear it for the one and only Florida Attorney General, Pam Tommy. Hi, hi, my friend. Good to see you. You too. You look fabulous. Thank you. All right. All right, uh, Attorney General, uh, my partner in crime. We're I'm on the between the law. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you make the law. You write the law. Okay. A for a few more weeks anyway. All right, Pam, you know, we want to talk about uh, Madam uh, Attorney General for a few more weeks anyway. All right, Madam Attorney General, you know, America is split on this Im issue of immigration. And as we go into the next segment uh, with uh, a couple of new guests that I'm not going to mention to you, uh, we're going to talk about young people and how they view it. But the truth is that this president has been getting a beating on immigration and the border issue, starting with the separation of kids from family members. Can you just tell our viewers in, in just a few sentences what required that and what has he done to change it? Well, initially, the president never wanted to separate children from their parents. It was a security issue that's been changed. Um, that's all been corrected. And he, we all know he deeply cares about children. And now more than ever in this world, securing our borders 
is so important. It's absolutely critical. That's why it's called homeland security. It's our homeland. And in truth, I mean, when President Obama separated parents and children, it was because the law required that he do that, that if you're going to have a child more than 20 days, you've got to, you know, you may be keeping the parents, but you let the child, you know, go into wherever they have them go. Uh, and that was something the president ended, correct? Yeah. Well, and, and of course, under both presidents, you always had the question of just because somebody says it's their child right. doesn't mean it is. And we found time and time again that separating became necessary to protect a child. Interesting. All right. So where are we with the border wall, Attorney General? I mean, look, you come from a law enforcement perspective. I mean, you know that 80 percent of the heroin, 90 percent of the drugs come through our southern border. Why can't we get this message out or am I missing? something. And, and Judge, this should be such a bipartisan issue because I've seen firsthand the drugs that have come into my state, into Florida, from Mexico. I've seen the assault rifles. We've seen the gang, Sir 13. I've been to Mexico dealing, helping the good attorneys general from Mexico, training them right. on how to protect their country mm -hmm. and work well with our country. So securing our borders, it's paramount for our homeland safety. And of course, helping great immigrants come to this country, but in a legal way. All right. How does the president in 2019 actually work with the Democrat majority? I mean, how is that going to can he get the border wall with the Democrats? Well, with Mrs. Pelosi, it's pretty clear that she's going to fight him every uh, step of the way. But the president go, doesn't go to Nancy Pelosi to get what he needs. He goes to the American people. I expect that he'll continue making his case to the American people. And uh, I believe we have some questions from the audience, so I'm going to walk over here. All right. Thank you. All right. Question. I'd just like to know about DACA. Um, I do not agree with it. As an immigrant myself, I came to the U.S. legal. The legal way, we went through a process. So I just want to know if this administration is going to give uh, to the dreamers, citizenship like the left one. Easy. Where, where are you from? I'm from Colombia. And what did you do to become uh, a citizen or to become a legal immigrant or to get a green card? Well, first my mom came to the United States and then we have to wait in Colombia like six years in order to come to the United States legal. We went to a process, we went to a criminal background, then we had to have an affidavit in order for us to come to the United States. In order, the affidavit was the purpose for the affidavit was for us not to live free out of the government. Like, right, that you have the ability to right, take care of yourself. Take care of ourselves. So, um, uh, all right, Attorney General, I mean, how do you answer that or Congress? Well, I think we can both take this, but, sure. but first, you know, the president came up with a four pillars plan for immigration because we're a country made up of immigrants and he understands that most of congress understands that but again it has to be done in a legal way just like you came into this country and so that's yeah, he has a plan i think where almost 1.8 million people could become citizens and that's the daca do you object to daca is that what you were saying yes i object to daca well, let, me, let me try to get you to buy into it in a, in, a, in a different way for a moment. Before we agreed, and the numbers were very different depending upon whose bill, to take those who were clearly brought here as a children and had no other life, in other words, the victims of their parents or family members' misconduct, before we offered a fix for that under President Trump's leadership, the Democrats were constantly using it to claim that we, we didn't care. When we brought up a DACA-only fix, when we brought up something to take care of the victims of the ambition of their parents, mm -hmm. we suddenly discovered that the other side wanted nothing to do with that. They wanted comprehensive or nothing. If it does nothing else, it shows that no matter what we do, we're going to have to do it probably without the other side's help because they don't really want a fix to illegal immigration. They want open borders. So I tell people, the reason we did it was it because it was the right thing to help some of these victims. The reason we continue to push it is because it shows that the people who want sanctuary cities and open borders will settle for nothing less. All right. And I have another question. Recently, the New Jersey attorney general uh, 
put in, put in force that the New Jersey local police and state police will not participate with ICE raids or participate with any kind of ICE enforcement. Is there anything that the federal government can do to, to make him cooperate with ICE? Well, I, I can tell you in the state of Florida, that will never happen. Um, we work hand in hand with ICE. I was with Homeland Security this week um, in, in Florida, and we work hand in hand with them. And they're great partners. But, so, but Congressman, what, and I don't mean to interrupt, but, but what can, because we're running out of time, what can the federal government do? Well, the president's been stymied a little bit in the short run by court decisions that made no sense. But in the long run, there's a combination of don't fund, don't provide funds that only are there if there's a quid pro quo, if there's a balance between what the state is doing and what the federal government is doing. Write all of these programs of federal dollars to, in fact, require reciprocal behavior. As we do that, then the court would say, you're right, you don't have to give it if they don't, if they don't cooperate. Currently, courts are ordering the president to give money even to states like California and New Jersey that are obstructing the benefit for, to the detriment of their own people. All right. Uh, thanks for those questions. And uh, Attorney General Pam Bondi, thank you for all the work you do in Florida. Uh, the Congressman Issa is leaving us, as is the Attorney General. I want to thank you both for being here. Hi. Thank you. God bless you, and may he continue to bless the nation that has showered this land with love for more than two centuries. Thank you all. God bless you all.